safe legal, isn't it? No sign in sheet, this one. Yeah. Hmm. Don't know what's done with that. So. Okay, we're going to um, start the day by thinking about a bit of theological uh, writing. Uh, so we'll maybe begin in a, in a theological way and uh, pray together as we uh, kick, uh, kick, kick the day off. So. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do uh, thank you for this morning and uh, the opportunity that we have uh, again to meet together in this way. Uh, Father, we thank you for the uh, privilege that there is uh, to be able to uh, study, uh, Father, to be able to uh, develop in our understanding of you and of your word. And we pray you continue to guide us uh, through uh, this session this morning. Uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, writing a theological essay. Well, uh, is that any different from writing any other uh, form of essay I hear you asking? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, well, uh, the answer to that, uh, of course, is quite simply uh, no and yes. Uh, so... Uh, in many ways, it's just the same uh, as writing any other uh, essay. Uh, you, you, need to, you need to read. Uh, you need to gather your material. Uh, you need to uh, form your answer or your, uh, or your argument. Uh, and you need to present that argument with uh, supporting uh, evidence. So if you're writing uh, an essay in uh, economics, uh, if you're writing an essay uh, in your uh, German class, your English literature class, your politics class, whatever, you'll be doing exactly uh, exactly the same uh, thing. And uh, the skills used in one form of essay writing are uh, transferable to writing a theological essay. So we're back to this area of, of transferable, uh, transferable skills. However, uh, for most of us, uh, writing a theological essay is also different uh, from writing an essay in another discipline. Uh, it's different because we're writing uh, about matters uh, about which we often feel strongly uh, because we have faith commitments. Uh, and so we're writing about matters in which we ourselves are personally uh, invested. Uh, we can perhaps look at uh, subjects that we've previously uh, studied uh, and written about, uh, history, uh, literature, uh, business, economics, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, and whilst we were interested maybe in those things, and we perhaps didn't feel particularly strongly uh, about them. Or it didn't make us feel angry or, or concerned uh, when someone was expressing uh, a point of view with which we disagreed. Uh, if you can think back to school, uh, that may be a painful process for some, uh, but if you think back to school, um, and you, for example, uh, were studying who was responsible uh, for the outbreak of the First World War, you probably couldn't have cared less uh, whether it was the, the Germans, uh, the Austrians, uh, uh, the Russians, the British. It was the Germans, by the way. But uh, you probably, uh, you know, you probably didn't have particularly strong feelings uh, uh, about that. However, uh, as we engage uh, with the study of, of theology, uh, we find ourselves dealing with ideas that we do feel strongly about. Uh, matters concerning truth. Uh, subjects which we believe are of eternal consequence. And not only do we feel strongly about these things, we actually believe it's good to feel strongly about these things. Uh, and that's probably what finds us here uh, studying in a, in a theological college uh, such as this. We're, we're people who are, are people of, of conviction. Uh, but as we engage with the, the study of theology and writing theological papers, uh, we must be careful then that we do not allow ourselves to be de deflected from our academic task, uh, which is to present reasoned, well-supported, well-argued, and balanced pieces of, of work. 
And so we must learn to write our, our theological papers uh, with the same sense of objectivity as we would if we were writing a paper on geography. Uh, so uh, again, nobody gets excited uh, about writing an essay about geography. Uh, you know, you can write that with a degree of detachment, uh, as long as you do it in colouring pencils, you're, you're absolutely fine. Uh, and we do need to develop that kind of same sense of, of objectivity uh, whenever it comes uh, to, the, uh, to the writing our theology papers. And in order uh, to do this, uh, you need to bear in mind uh, a number of important points. Uh, and these points I'm going to uh, run through this morning. Are, are particularly pertinent uh, as we deal with those with whom we disagree. And you will find a lot of people uh, when you're studying theology with whom you disagree uh, on a range, of, uh, a range of issues. And the first thing I would say is give your opponents a fair hearing. Give your opponents a fair hearing. Listen carefully to what your opponents uh, are saying. Preferably read their works and not just what people are saying about them. Okay, So if you can, uh, read uh, uh, their works and not just what people are saying about them. And it's all too easy for us to dismiss someone uh, because of, of the baggage uh, that we associate with them. Uh, and many of those uh, who we might regard with suspicion do hold their views sincerely. And we want to listen to what they have to say in the same way we would want them to listen to us. Uh, indeed, when we give them a fair hearing, we will often discover that we can learn from them, even when we disagree with them. Uh, students are sometimes pleasantly surprised to discover how much they have learned from scholars who are on a completely different page theologically. And you need to remember that recognising someone's gifts is different from agreeing with their theology. So you can recognise someone else's gifts, but that doesn't mean you're, you're buying the whole, uh, the whole, whole package. Um, just for the benefit of those who have uh, studied uh, with me at undergraduate level, uh, I'll remind you of, of our old friend Schleiermacher. They were, these guys were always thankful uh, that they didn't have to write uh, essays on Schleiermacher. Uh, trying to spell his name was always a bit of a, a, bit of a, bit of a challenge. Uh, but uh, Schleiermacher uh, was uh, known to many as the father of liberal theology, uh, beginning in the, the 19th century. He was the father of liberal theology. You couldn't have got anybody who's more opposed to him than Charles Hodge, uh, the famous American uh, Presbyterian. Uh, a scholar uh, and Hodge was really in many respects the father of Presbyterian orthodoxy and yet uh, Hodge had the warmest regard for Schleiermacher uh, he had the warmest regard for him and his devotion uh, and his love for God he criticised his theology uh, but he, after Schleiermacher's death he wrote with great warmth about Schleiermacher uh, and his, his devotion to God, his love of hymn singing. And he said, I'm sure he's singing those hymns even now. Disagreed with him, fundamentally disagreed with him, but yet had great admiration for the man and his devotion uh, uh, and his gifts. So you do want to give people a, a fair hearing. Uh, so you, you may well end up disagreeing with them, but you do want to, to give them a, a fair hearing. Secondly, try to understand not only what they are saying, but why they are saying it. So, for example, you may discover that errors, their errors arise sometimes from what we regard it as a misguided uh, attempt uh, to defend the faith. Again, if we look at our, our old friend Schleiermacher as an example, uh, he set out to provide an apologetic uh, against, uh, for, for the Christian faith against those who despised it in his day. Now, he ended up uh, perhaps in entirely the wrong place uh, in doing that. But he was very earnest, very sincere in his attempts to what, what he was doing. So you want to understand uh, what people are saying. Not simply, let's read what they're saying. Oh, I disagree with that. You know, it's a terrible thing to say. But to think, why are they actually saying that? Uh, 
towards motivating them uh, in saying that. You also want to understand what they, what they are saying because it may in fact reveal a blind spot in your own thinking. Uh, and that can very often, very often happen. Uh, for example, uh, very often today we, we find ourselves uh, in debates uh, discussions about how we treat those dealing with same-sex attraction issues. Uh, and, we, we, uh, and it's very easy to kind of get drawn into kind of a, you know, a banging together of, of the heads and that. But again, uh, when people take a different approach to that, uh, than, than we might take. Again, try to understand why they're saying. So it's a little bit, you know, when you when you read the newspaper, you uh, you can get infuriated by the headline, you know, uh, particularly if you're a Daily Mail reader, you know, but uh, read on into the, the article, you know, and you find out an awful lot more. So again, don't get distracted by, by the headlines. You know, read and try to understand uh, what, what people, people are saying. Now, my wife... Uh, Kind of has become a, a kind of a bit of a, a, a kind of a COVID expert. Our kids keep her going. Say, Mom, you have a degree in epidemiology uh, from WhatsApp University. You know, over the, over the course of uh, over the course of course of lockdown, you know. Uh, but she does get kind of in, infuriated if you if, you know listening to the news in detail. She said there was a whole thing yesterday. You know, outbreak of you know COVID and and Lauren Grammer. Just read the article on. One person had had it about a fortnight ago and they haven't been at school since, you know. You know, so, so again, that's what we're saying. You get beyond the headlines. You know, get beyond the headlines and try and understand why people are saying the things uh, that they are saying. And I say sometimes we discover actually we've, we've a bit of a blind spot in our own thinking. <coughs> there was something I had never really thought about. I'd never really thought about before. On the other hand, if you carefully try to understand why people are saying things you will discover that it's in truly understanding their argument very often that you will then find the greatest weaknesses of their argument. So once you understand it better, that actually enables you to identify just the, the, the very points of, points of weakness. And so a skillful, well-judged cut will accomplish much more than a head, hot-headed bludgeon. Uh, so, and furthermore, uh, I'll say more about this in a second, you want to uh, avoid character assassination. You actually want to deal with the issues, uh, and that's vitally important. You know, so you know if you're writing a, a history essay, you know you you wouldn't write well. You know, so and so said this because he's a bit of a blow. You know, you'd be dealing with the you'd be dealing with the issues, uh, and we need to do the same uh, in our in our theological our theological writing. In similar vein, then thirdly, don't set up straw men. In other words, do not caricature views just to tear them down. Professor McHeretic's views show that he is trying to deceive people into hell with his universalist views. Well, can you clearly demonstrate that that is motiv that's his motivation and intent? You must deal with the arguments that Professor McHeretic is making. Your aim is to, uh, using a sporting metaphor, your aim is to get the ball and not the man. You know, so uh, I'm not going to judge any of you as people who get the man rather the ball in sporting terms. But the ball, order, <laughs> way of <laughs> the ball may go past me, but a man never will. You know, so uh, so uh, so you, so you want to avoid. I uh, say so you want to kind of you want to avoid chopping people down. Uh, and furthermore, you you will often find that your judgments need to be provisional uh, rather than uh, the, than definitive. So you might say, if Professor McHeretic's argument is followed to its conclusion, then it appears that that will lead to universalism. You know, so, you, so you're, you're dealing with his argument rather than kind of setting him up as that straw man. And then you might want to go on to say, well, why does this lead to universalism? And, and tease that out rather than just lambasting, uh, lambasting your, your opponent kind of, kind of thing. As someone has said, make sure your words are sweet since you may have to eat them. Uh, so, uh, uh, fourthly, uh, do not dismiss people as stupid. You may well disagree with someone, but that does not make them stupid. Uh, people who have sustained careers as theologians for several decades, who have written extensively and been read by others sometimes for centuries, they tend not to be stupid. 
So they can be deeply flawed. Uh, you may disagree with them, but do not treat them as being stupid. And remember, people will be reading their works long after your essay is gathering dust in a filing cabinet. Or, in these cases, when we're not allowed to keep things anymore, long after yours is a keystroke somewhere in cyberspace, uh, people will, will still be reading, uh, still be reading their, their, their works. And again, the key is to deal with the issues, not to launch a personal attack on anyone. So your focus must always be the issues and not the person. Okay, uh, next, where are we, number five is this? Uh, cite credible academic resources. Um, you've touched on this uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit yesterday. Cite credible academic resources. Uh, when marshalling your evidence, use credible academic material. Uh, we, uh, Sarah talked a bit about that uh, yesterday. Uh, credible books, uh, credible, uh, credible journals. Now, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, People will, will appear in an essay, you know, the, the big ladybird book of theology, you know, uh, it, it, it's not credible, you know, or, or a book, you know, somebody's kind of struggling or, or feeling a bit lazy, so they go and look in their grandest wardrobe, you know, and they, they find this book that was written by somebody in 1923, uh, you know, for a, a popular audience, but it says the word theology on it, uh, they are, right, well, go for that, you know, so, so again, uh, think carefully, uh, you know, about, about uh, what, you're, what, you're, what you're looking at and make sure that the material you use is credible. Do your best not to use sermons or blogs or, or popular pieces. Occasionally you may want to, uh, to, 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 to introduce those. You know, so you may want to write, write, a, write an essay, uh, for, for example, on, on health and wealth gospel, the health and wealth gospel or something like that. And you may, in that case, want to cite something like things that people have said on blogs or, or sermons or, or videos to set the context. But that is not credible as a source for researching and examining. You know, so you do need credible uh, material uh, uh, to, to think about. Uh, so you must be able uh, to support your argument through the use of good, well-researched material. And again, back to thinking a little bit about uh, what you're thinking about critical thinking on, on Monday, it's not just opinion. You're not just going on somebody else's opinion. Uh, so uh, think, uh, is, this, is this work credible? Is it good? Is it well researched? Or is that just Joe, Joe Bloggs uh, sounding off on the internet uh, about something? Uh, and as I said uh, on Monday, a popular blogger or, or preacher does not make someone's views a credible academic uh, resource. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, again, you'll, you'll find credible academics commenting on blogs about subject areas that they, they, they're not really qualified to speak about. You know, so you do have to be careful. And I suppose we should be even more careful in the uh, era of fake news. You know, there's a lot of fakery out there on the internet, you know, uh, uh, and the, the famous words of President Abraham Lincoln, not everything that's tweeted about me is true, you know, so uh, you do, uh, <laughs> you know, need to, need to think and investigate and use your, use your critical, uh, use your critical faculties. Uh, number six, are we now? Um, do not use pejorative language. He's nothing but a liberal. This is part of a downward, roomward spiral. Uh, this leads people to spout nonsense uh, from the from the pulpit. Again, you wouldn't do that in any other essay in any other any other subject. So so don't do it in this one. Uh, my former uh, tutor and latterly colleague Morris Stelling used to say to us, "Remember, you're not writing slogans on a gable wall." Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so again, you're you're writing an academic essay, you know. So, so again, uh, use temperate language, uh, and again, uh, don't be don't be dismissive uh, of people. Next up, uh, avoid generalizations. Uh, there is a danger that we make generalizations, 
Uh, and we use this then as an excuse for not actually examining uh, what someone is saying. And when we take time to examine matters more closely, uh, we realise that beliefs are often much more nuanced uh, than we imagine. It also tends to reveal our ignorance. Uh, I've been teaching theology uh, for about 25 years now, and students have often said to me, what do Baptists believe about? And uh, <coughs> I always say to them, well, you'll have to ask them. You'll have to ask them. I know what this Baptist believes, but I cannot speak for all Baptists everywhere. So avoid those generalizations. And one area where people fall into generalizations, very often I find in essays, is when they talk about the contemporary churches. So people will write something like, churches today have given in to postmodernism. All churches? Well, which churches? Do you actually have any evidence of that? Oh, the fact you've been reading John MacArthur's blog for the last 20 years, <laughs> kind, of, kind of thing. You know, so, so, so think, think carefully uh, and avoid those kind of generalizations. If you're making a statement, can you support that? Do you have any evidence for that? Or are you just kind of being a bit lazy and saying, ah, that's, what they, that's what everybody thinks? Okay. Uh, note well uh, on this one. Do not preach. Do not preach. It is an essay. It is not uh, a sermon. So be careful not uh, to preach either well or badly. Do not preach. We see here the beginning of a false system of teaching that has deluded many lost and helpless souls. It's a system that is still with us today and many churches continue to blindly follow this to the eternal destruction of their people. Don't do it. Don't do it. You may have doubts about your tutor's salvation. Uh, those may have been reinforced uh, regarding me in the last few days. But the essay is not the place to challenge them. You know, ask them to do two ways to live. Uh, invite them in an alpha course or whatever, but don't put it into the, <laughs> don't put it into the essay. Okay? Don't put it into the essay. So avoid, uh, avoid preaching. Okay? Uh, finally, avoid value judgments. Okay? So avoid value judgments. Avoid saying things like good, bad, evil, wrong, and the dreadful one, interesting. Interesting. It's my essay. <laughs> Carson makes a good point. Does he? <laughs> what makes it good? What makes it good? McGrath says something interesting. He's interested. Interesting for who? Packer is persuasive. Who's persuaded by him? You? Who cares whether you're persuaded or not? Yeah. Right is helpful. How is he helpful? Who's he helpful to? You know, so kind of avoid these kind of bland value judgments uh, that it's very easy to kind of, kind of sink into. Again, you need to offer evaluations that can be sustained by evidence. Can you, can you give evidence? And if you can give evidence, you should be able to reach a conclusion rather that says more than, well, this is interesting. Now, some of you uh, will be familiar with the points that I, I've been making here through your, your previous study of, of theology. And for others, uh, obviously, this is going to be your first foray uh, into writing a theological essay. But don't panic uh, if you don't get it all right the first time round. Uh, so, as we noted in the first morning, this whole process is about improving. And don't worry if you get it wrong. I'll tell you. You know, uh, make, make, make no doubt about that. I'll, I'll tell you. And I'll say, certainly for the study skills, the great thing is you're going to have drafts, to be able to do, do things in drafts. So you will get feedback. So, you know, if you submit your first essay and it's an absolute nightmare, and sometimes people find that, you know, when they're not used to essay writing, they submit their first essay uh, and it uh, comes 
back like a sunburnt penguin, black and white and red all over, you know. So uh, they get they get a back like that, uh, uh, but they have a chance to kind of have another crack at it. So this is all about it. It's all about improving. Uh, so I say, don't worry if you kind of suddenly uh, see uh, in triple red ink, interesting, not that word, you know. So. Uh, uh, Another great word uh, to avoid uh, is um, the word surely. Uh, surely. If you're writing surely, that means you've run out of evidence. <laughs> you're not at all sure, uh, but you're hoping that everybody else will, will agree with you. Uh, so, so try and avoid uh, writing sentences. When you say something and then say surely, you know, uh, probably nothing sure about it at all. Uh, uh, that's probably the weakest point of your argument uh, when you write uh, when you write uh, write surely. Okay, any questions or, or any any comments about, about, about any of that? It also works the other way for you know not just people that you disagree with, but uh, and for emphasis on people who you do agree with. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Johnny. You know, we, we kind of all have our all have our heroes, uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, somebody says something, <laughs> you know, that, that, that they must be right, but they don't always get it right, you know. So, and again, that's part of the, the kind of whole idea of, of learning that kind of critical uh, critical evaluation, that critical thinking. You know, what is it? You know, is this person credible on, on this point? Uh, you know, I benefited wonderfully from a sermon, but is he credible? On, on this uh, on, the, on this point, um, Martin Lloyd Jones, of course, was kind of the great kind of mid twentieth century preacher, uh, and people absolutely uh, uh, adored him. A wonderful preacher, uh, but he had his blind spots, and uh, over the years, people have uh, pointed out those blind spots. Well, those people in certain quarters are just absolutely, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, there are people, there there are bookshops of a certain persuasion who won't stock books that say anything critical about Martin Lloyd Jones. You know, so uh, the man at feet of clay, wonderful preacher, uh, very important figure. So yeah, you, you know, we do have to also be uh, be uh, critical uh, of the people uh, the way critical, as we've said, in the best sense, thinking, thinking about people and what the, what what they say. Yeah, and you'll be fine doing that as long as it's not about Martin Lloyd Jones. <laughs> well, otherwise, we'll, we'll release your essay on the internet, <laughs> and you, you'll find that you can't get a you, you can't get a seat uh, in your local McDonald's for love nor money. You know. So, so. Could, could you explain that, that, that a little bit more? I mean, Yeah, again, I think part of it is, again, just being, uh, you know, uh, say, again, you're back to, uh, you know, uh, kind of, is this a credible kind of resource on this, on this subject? Yeah. You know, so I, I think that, I think that's, uh, and part of that, I think, to be fair, Stephen, uh, there's a bit of learning on the job on that, you know, as well. So, yeah. you know, so, uh, you know, John MacArthur, for example, uh, has, you know, publishes a, a whole ream of books but a lot of them are just based on his sermons. Yeah. And you find that with a lot of American evangelicals. They preach a series of sermons and because of the, the setup on the stage, she can then publish a, publish a book about that. That doesn't make that a credible yeah. academic source any more than going and uh, listening to the listening to the sermon would all of a sudden. Yeah. You know, so so a lot of that actually just becomes it becomes opinion. So again, it's just thinking a little bit about that. So it's, it's not, uh, you know, as you say, it's not saying, well, I never, ever, you know, yeah. uh, again, it's just thinking a little bit. Is that a, a valuable, credible resource to be looking at in relation to this, in, in relation to this subject? Uh, and I think very often, kind of the, the first rule of thumb uh, in the midst of all of this is, you know, uh, you're kind of you'll be given some reading in relation to the various modules. Uh, there's some reading on on the descriptors. You know, so those are the kinds of places you want to want to go and, and think about in the first the first instance. You know. The, that's kind of there, if you like, for a reason, you know, to kind of kind of guide you and, and, and direct you. 
sort of, sort of uh, be a little bit more reliant on that, yeah. and kind of more popular people like you know, for example, for example, Spurgeon or, or MacArthur or whatever. You know, um, if you're going to deal with them, you're probably going to deal with them. You know, uh, maybe in, if you're doing something exegetical, you know, it might give you a little bit of colour to quote John MacArthur, who said in the sermon, da 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 da. You know, or, or Spurgeon, who said blah blah. You know, rather than. They're my go-to guy. Yeah, I, I found, and, and you, you picked me up on one of the very first day in that the feeder beliefs that have been made popular by Keller mm. are not his. And so sometimes I find that if you look at the bibliography of some of these popular books, yes. they're just regurgitating ideas yeah. that, that are yeah. academic, but they're putting them across in a more popular way. Yeah, you know, yeah. So. And you find that all the time. I mean, another example was, I mean, if you go on to the the Mark Twain quotation I used on Monday. If you go on the internet, you will find nearly everybody says that's by Mark Twain, but it, but it's not. You know, but it's become associated with him. So again, it's just you know, as you say, you know, scratch a little bit beneath the beneath the surface, uh, using you know credible kind of academic uh, resources. You know, uh, and by and large, it's not always completely uh, completely reliable. But by and large, you want to use a book with a bibliography. You, know, you you want to find out where he's got his ideas, yeah. where he's got his ideas from. You know, is there a bibliography? Are, are there references that you can go and look up for your uh, look up for yourself? So it's a whole new level of discernment. It is. It is. Um, the mother of all postgraduate skills is critical thinking. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So uh, uh, and again, uh, the problem with. Uh, Critical thinking is once you start, you'll know people to stop. <laughs> that's not that. That's not, that's not necessarily. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you have to avoid. Uh, I think you have to avoid a bit of, bit of cynicism sometimes. You know. So, so. When you say about uh, not to set up straw men, like if uh, I was looking at a book by Bonhoeffer, mm. okay, uh, rather than setting him up as a straw man. No, no. Again, you know, can you credibly kind of say something uh, about him? You know, so if I, if I started, if I started to look at Bonhoeffer and kind of dismissed him, said, "Well, you know, Bonhoeffer, yes, he fought the Nazis, but at the end of the day, he was a theological liberal." You know, you know that, that's kind of setting him up. That's setting him up for a fall because I'm, I'm not actually inv investigating his views. You know, I, I'm kind of going straight for him and telling everybody, well, you know, no matter what he says, we can dismiss him. Right. You know, b because he was, he, he was, he was a liberal. You know, or or we can dismiss so and so because he is a, you know, he's a Catholic theologian. Or we can dismiss, you know. So so again, it's dealing with the views, uh, and, yes. and not not yes. the not the person. Okay, uh, move on a, a, a little bit. Um, the second thing we're, uh, we're going to uh, look at then, uh, this morning is the whole uh, process of managing uh, your, your assignment. Dealing with the pitfalls, yeah. overcoming the pitfalls. Okay, so we've noted uh, from the outset uh, that one of the key problems uh, that you'll face is that of time management. Um, that's obviously a key issue when it comes to producing an assignment. Uh, and in this session, uh, we want to consider some of the, the major pitfalls that you, you might need to deal with when it comes to managing uh, your assignment. And the first of these is procrastination, uh, often referred to as the thief of time. Uh, and procrastination may be defined as simply avoiding uh, doing something that needs to be done. Uh, many of us uh, engage in procrastination in many different aspects of life. If you think you don't, uh, go home and talk to your wife. Uh, decorating a bedroom, uh, fixing that leaky pipe 
uh, calling uh, so and so, uh, taxing your car, whatever it might be, uh, going to the dentist. And we usually avoid doing uh, what needs to be done because of some unsavoury uh, association. And when it comes to writing your assignment, the reasons for procrastination include a number of things. Uh, it can be perfectionism, uh, getting stuck uh, at an early stage and putting off finishing because you, you know, it's just not going to be perfect uh, and you kind of become frozen uh, because it's not going to be perfect. Uh, then there can be anxiety uh, about how to do the task properly, uh, uh, not knowing uh, what is required, uh, feeling you're overwhelmed by, by information, uh, you have a fear of failure, uh, and so kind of all those unpleasant associations, you, you, you put it off. Uh, another problem can be uh, you don't feel ownership of the task. Uh, you're being asked to do something uh, you didn't want to do, uh, so you, you've picked, you know, you've come to choose your fifth module and you're thinking, oh, you know, there's slim pickings here, uh, you know, so, so I don't really want to do that. Or, or you're being asked to, to do a question or you're being given a question that's not really the question you would like to, uh, like, like to ask. So again, unpleasant, so, you know, you kind of push it uh, down the line or cave into the long grass. Perhaps then you have low tolerance for things that are uncomfortable or, or difficult. Uh, you know, you kind of... You know, you're just the kind of person who gives up a bit. You know, uh, if, if this is if this is if this is tough. So, if you're troubled by procrastination, then there are a number of things that you might think about. Uh, the first thing you might think about is there a specific part of the project uh, that you're stuck on? You know, for example, uh, you know, uh, I don't know where to begin, and I don't know where to start or how to start writing or whatever. You know, so, so again, uh, you know, try and identify what it is that's keeping you back from doing this. Okay? Uh, if it's an unpleasant uh, association, well, unfortunately, uh, I think you just have to suck it up uh, 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 and do it. But there may be something that's, that's kind of putting you off, you know, uh, and it may be something like you know, just, the, just the volume of work or not knowing where to start or something. So, so, so try and identify what it is that's, that's holding, holding you back. Secondly, you might think about things you're doing to avoid work. Uh, uh, are you supposed to be working, but you're surfing the internet? You know, you've never seen a water skiing hamster before, and all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, you, you could watch this and repeat for, for endless hours. Are you doing things that look productive, but aren't? And uh, I'm not looking at these guys on the, the left in particular, uh, but uh, you know there, there's a tendency to kind of think you're in the library, uh, but you're, you're really not. You're really not in the library doing any work. You know, you're you're looking for books. You know, you're you're chatting to chatting to your friends. You know, and suddenly you, you realise, oh, this most recent volume of evangelicals now is out today. I must have, must have read at that. So you're you're doing things to avoid working. Uh, so so again, need to think about that. Are there things I'm actually doing? Uh, that are kind of filling in time uh, and that's putting me off a bit. Again, another issue in terms of procrastination is to ask, am I unable to cope due to other pressures? And again, sometimes that can, that can lead us to put, put things off. Well, there are a lot of pressures on, you know, something's happened at work or something's happened at home and I'm feeling under pressure and I'm kind of just you know, kicking this into the long grass. So again, you, you kind of need to, need to examine yourself. So again, if you're putting things off, you know, these are the kind of the key things to think about what it is that, that, that's putting you off and uh, begin, to, begin to address that. So what can you do to address, the, address these issues? Well, plan your work and set achievable deadlines. So, so if you're struggling, you're, you're putting uh, stuff off, plan your work uh, and set a short-term goal. Say something like, I'll have my essay plan in place by next Friday. So don't sit and think, oh, you know, 4,000 words, where do, where do I start? Uh, and you spend a fortnight thinking, oh, where do I start? Well, there's a fortnight gone. You know, set yourself an achievable deadline and say, you know, that's the first part of what, I, what I'm going to do. Right, what, what's my next goal? Well, my next goal is that in two weeks' time I'll have 1,000 words written, or three weeks' time, or, or whatever, whatever it is. Or at the end of the month I'll, I'll have read all the journal articles, or whatever it might be. So set yourself an achievable uh, achievable deadline. Write down uh, your timetable uh, uh, and stick to it. 
So uh, lots of people I, I see uh, postgraduate level who say, yeah, uh, this timetable. I mean, does it really matter if I push it on another couple of weeks? Well, that's stopped to be a timetable, hasn't it? You know, if you want to get the train at Moira Station, and you went for the train at 9.15, and they said, well, actually, we decided to push this on a couple of hours. <laughs> you would say, well, what's the point of having a timetable then? Uh, you know, uh, and the same applies here. You know, get a timetable and stick to it. You know, uh, and aim, aim to do that. And if your timetable fails, well then, recognise that it's failed, and start another timetable. You know, and keep the timetable going, so that so that you know what you're what you're working uh, what you're working to. Just don't say I meant to that done by, by next by, by Friday. It's not it's not it's not done. What, what's the point? No, start your new timetable because the task still has to be still has to be done. Then identify issues, uh, the issues maybe that you're facing that we've chatted about, uh, and have a chat with your your tutor about this. You know, say you know, I'm struggling a bit on that this or talk to your fellow students uh, uh, and you know again you might find they're having similar issues or, or struggling in similar ways so you know keep in touch with one another what postgraduate groups have done in the last uh, number of years uh, is they, they've had a, a kind of a whatsapp group and again that's just a good way to kind of keep in touch with one another uh, if one of you takes responsibility for setting up a whatsapp group and it's also a good way of keeping track of track of books you know, does somebody have book X out at the minute? Um, well then, uh, you know, uh, you know. Hopefully, they'll, they'll hand up and say yes, I have, and I'll, I'll have it until Wednesday, and then I'm leaving it back or, or, or whatever. You know, so so say set up a little WhatsApp group. Uh, you know, uh, keep in touch with one another. And say if you're, if you're struggling, uh, you you can be a, a real help and encouragement to, to each other uh, as you do that. A second uh, issue then that you might face is perfectionism. Uh, one skills website notes that perfectionism can seem like an admirable trait, but it can conversely lead to not doing your best, compromising the quality of your work, non-completion or non-submission, or the neglect of some tasks at the expense of others. And difficulties caused by perfectionism can include getting started. So some people are perfectionists. I, you know, I can't get started. I, I, have I read enough? I don't, I don't think I've read enough. Um, how am I going to introduce this? You know, how am I going to write that perfect first sentence that when David Luke reads it, he'll be drooling all over his, all over his laptop, you know, uh, when he reads that. So, so some perfectionists, they just can't get started. Perfectionists then very often have problems developing the, their written work. So you can spend your, your time endlessly rewriting sections or, or redrafting the whole or, or making lots and lots of minor changes. Now, I remember uh, getting ready to submit my, uh, my doctoral thesis uh, and some, you know, doing one or two little checks at the end. I'm looking at this thinking, this is not great, you know. I could have done this so much better. You know, uh, there it was, you know, it was ready to go. You know, I could still be doing it, you know, to, to today. You know, so there comes a point in life where you have to put down the, the pen or gently put down the laptop uh, and, you know, hit the send button or, or whatever. Uh, my uh, youngest uh, daughter is called Emma, and uh, we say, that's a great name for you, Lucas. It rhymes with dilemma. Uh, because she can never make up her mind to do anything. <laughs> and she was sitting dithering one day. You know, what course will I apply for? Well, you know, she's down to her last two. And, yeah, you, you cast the call it these days. You know, down to her last two. Oh, what am I going to do? She's sitting dithering. Her brother walked over and hit sand. <laughs> <laughs> that was her decision made for her. Uh, you know, that, that's how she ended up in. Queens instead of Edinburgh, you know, <laughs> that was how the deci deci decision was made. So sometimes the perfectionist, you have to kind of, uh, kind of just uh, say, yeah, uh, 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 I finished. So to counter, help counter perfectionism, you can try, uh, first of all, getting perspective. So remember when you're writing an assignment, it's a 4,000 word essay, it's not the Sistine Chapel, you know, so uh, get, it in, get it in perspective. Secondly, set realistic goals. What's expected of you? Ask your tutor. 
Look at the marking criteria on the handout you're given. What are you being asked to do? So you're not being asked to write the definitive work on the doctrine of justification by faith. You're being asked to write a, an essay. So set realistic goals uh, about what's being asked, asked of you. Then, as I've already suggested, acknowledge that your work will not be perfect. Acknowledge that your work will not be perfect. No matter how hard you try, your work will not be perfect. Nor does it need to be perfect. 70% uh, plus gets a distinction, just the same as 90% gets a distinction. 55% will achieve a pass, the same as 75%. So do your best. Do your best to fulfill your own potential. And don't expect perfection. As I, I've been marking uh, theological essays for about 25 years, uh, and I've never seen a perfect one yet. Uh, and with all due respect to you gentlemen, I'm not expecting to see a perfect one from any of you uh, either. You know, so, so don't expect perfection. Ign acknowledge that. Look, this, is, this isn't going to be perfect. It's an essay. You know, so, so get that, that sense of perspective on that. And again, recognize, you know, is this where I'm at? You know, some of you are, are probably going to be people who are going to be sitting your entire time in, your, in, in the 50s. If that's where you're going to be, I accept that. You know, I'm, I'm a kind of a guy, you know, and I, I maybe, you know, run from 55 to 58 generally. Sometimes I've maybe, you know, uh, gone crazy and get 60, you know. <laughs> but, you know, if, if that's where you're at, that's, that, that's, that's where you're at. But you're still doing the course, and the course, as I said on Monday, is about more than getting the, the marks. You know, you want to profit from the teaching. Uh, you want to enjoy the course uh, and not be driven by the fact that oh, I really need to get, you know, I really need to get 75 or, you know, what, what am I even doing here? You know, if I, you know, accept, you know, uh, where you're at. Try to develop. We'll try to encourage you, as I said Monday, about how you develop uh, and how you move forward. We'll, we'll seek to do that. But again, just to acknowledge, uh, I say your own work won't be perfect. Uh, draft rough notes. If perfectionism is stopping you writing something, then draft rough notes and work from those. And that'll get you up and running. So, uh, you know, so, so get something on the page. Uh, and sometimes, again, uh, you know, if you're struggling a bit, uh, as we'll say with, with writer's block, a bit of friction. Pen and paper sometimes better than sitting looking at the, at the laptop and then that pop-up comes of the, the water skiing squirrel or whatever it is, you know, and you're way off on another, uh, another track or that, that email comes in from work. Writer's block uh, is another hurdle sometimes you have to overcome. Perhaps sounds a bit melodramatic, uh, but it can happen when you're writing an, an assignment. Perhaps your ideas will not come. Uh, you're struggling to find the right words or expression, uh, or you feel under pressure and you, you think your mind has gone blank. Again, draft rough notes. Getting something on paper helps. You know, just getting something on paper sometimes just, you, just helps. Develop an alternative strategy. If your initial approach fails, then think about think think differently. You know, I, I could approach this maybe a bit differently. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm heading off on the wrong kind of trajectory here. Uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll I'll try a different essay plan. You know, and that, that that'll help. Another uh, something similar to, to dra drafting rough notes is free writing. Again, writing without worrying about referencing precision or, or anything like that. Again, uh, you know. Knock out five or six hundred words, and you can uh, that's you started. And uh, you can go back and revise that, scrap it, add the references, uh, whatever, but just get yourself up and running. Uh, write, write something. Take a break. If it's a temporary problem, take a, an hour off, you know, uh, uh, go and do something, go for a walk, uh, go and get a cup of coffee, uh, whatever, whatever it might be. If it's a longer problem, uh, more enduring, try to forget about it uh, and come back. If you're sitting there, uh, you know, you're wasting time, you know, if you're, if you're not doing anything. You'd be far better going and watching Coronation Street or something, you know, and go and do that. And, and try again tomorrow night, you know, or, you know, a couple of nights later when the, the mind's, mind's a, bit, a bit fresher or, or whatever. Another problem can be then getting bogged down. Sometimes students have a feeling of being overwhelmed by the project and they simply feel bogged down. 
The reason behind this is often that the student has just launched into the project. They haven't gone through the planning and the preparation stages. They're trying to do everything at once. And if you're probably, if you're bogged down, you probably need just to go back and plan uh, your work. Uh, working to a plan or a structure will help you to navigate through, uh, through, through problems. Uh, so again, if you're getting bogged down, go back, to, go back in that sense, almost quite literally to the drawing board. Go back to look at the blueprint uh, and think about the, the plan. Uh, but of course that assumes that the plan is in place. Uh, uh, so you do need to, to plan uh, and think about uh, the structure of what you're doing. Concentration span. Uh, one of the issues that can confront you is that you've set time aside to work. Perhaps you've decided you're going to set aside Wednesday afternoon, whatever it is. But then you find that you, you lack sufficient concentration to make the most of that two or three hours. Instead, you find your mind wandering. Uh, you're off making uh, cups of coffee. Uh, you're suddenly uh, developed an intense interest in antiques roadshow. Uh, you, you really want to know, will that property uh, in sale ever be really redeveloped and fetch a quarter of a million pounds or whatever it might be, or your, your water skiing squirrels back. Uh, and problems with concentration can be because your concentration span is naturally short. So some people even at work, you know, are easily, easily distracted. You know, it can, can happen. Some people, are, some people are like that. Uh, uh, again, I say you're, you're, you're just an, an easily distracted kind of kind of person. You're tired. Uh, you've been busy in work, and when you sit down, you, you feel exhausted rather than enthused. Or you sit down and think, oh, the last thing I want to do is, is this. Uh, or again, as we've said, you might have a little enthusiasm about the, the project. That's not really my thing. That's not really the thing, the thing I wanted to, wanted to do. So if you're having difficulties concentrating, then you might consider when you, when you work best. Uh, and many people find uh, that you're more apt to be sluggish after lunch. You know, so some people, you know, they're, they're really uh, morning uh, people and they get up, uh, get up and do, do that. I was listening to a, a well-known uh, Christian historian being interviewed and the interviewer asked him, well, you know, how do you, how do you write a book? He said, I get up uh, and write 500 words uh, every morning before breakfast. his way of working. Just get up and do that. So, so again, uh, just finding, uh, say, the, the time that works uh, works best for you. Take regular breaks. Uh, if you uh, might be, if you're short attention span, do 20 minutes and then take a 10 minute break. 45 minutes followed by a, by a 15 minute break. Uh, and during your break, leave your 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 study environment. Go for a go for a walk. Out into the, the back garden, uh, have a have a fag, whatever it is you, you do uh, in the back garden. Uh, go and have your coffee in a different room. Don't sip your coffee at your desk, but, but have a break. Uh, someone told me they used to work in the same library when they were a student. There, there, was a, there, was a, there was a man working there, and he noticed how very disciplined he was. He worked for three quarters of an hour steadily, and he said after 45 minutes, as regular as clockwork, he said he would sit up straight and go. Then back in uh, again. He said you could have set your watch by, by by him doing that. And he said he later found out that man was John Stott. Uh, that's, that's, that's how he worked. You know. So so get your break. Uh, get get refreshed. Consider your working environment. Is your room too stuffy? Uh, you get in there, oh, toasty. Uh, and, and twenty minutes later, you wake up with a dribble running down your <laughs> down, down your chin. You know. So is it, is it too stuffy? Is your seat too comfortable? Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, yeah, you like this idea, park or no, recliner, you know. <laughs> that may not be the best seat to, seat to, seat to work on. Are there too many distractions uh, nearby? So again, you might find it, I, I just need to switch off the phone. Uh, I need to turn off the work email, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, that little background thing that I, I love of the, you know, I'm, uh, you know, those kind of mice running around the wheel, you know, and I'll watch it. But, you know, Ellen's going to distract you, you know, get, get, get rid of that. And when your thoughts start to wander, I have never done this, but I'm told this is an effective strategy. If your thoughts start to wander, say out loud, stop, and get back on track. And seemingly you do this every time your thoughts wander, even if it's several times a minute. 
literally say out loud, stop. Say, I've never tried it, but seemingly it's a recognised, a recognised, recognised technique. So don't be shouting at me now. I might be offended. But uh, so, so, so all the, the issues we've highlighted here remind us that it's important to start your work early. Leaving things to the last minute uh, will only exacerbate any of these problems. So postgraduate study uh, does not lend itself to burning the midnight oil. I need to say this very loudly. Uh, uh, Case Letitia has tuned in from France. Uh, she was talking about doing things at the last minute. Postgraduate study does not lend itself to burning the midnight oil. So don't try and pull some kind of all-nighter. Don't leave everything to the night before uh, and then panic. You need to plan your work. You need to think about it. So it's not just about getting the essay in. It's about the process of study itself, profiting from that, learning from that, and then completing the assignment. So you, you want to take time and, and think. Okay, any questions or any, any comments uh, about that? So in terms of planning in the draft, I know there's a, a kind of, but it can obviously be in before that date. Oh, yeah. So yeah. To, get, to give yourself time to revise it. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, as my daughter likes to put it, hand in dates are, a target, are not a target. You know, they're a deadline. So uh, if you can get it done before that, great. Either for the draft or for the main, the main piece, you know. Uh, now the way <coughs> the way we work, it's for your benefit if you hand it in early. You know, we're not able to mark it until the deadline passes because otherwise, your kind of your uh, plagiarism report won't mm -hmm. come through. So we have to wait until everybody's is in, and then we see the plagiarism reports. They all come together, so so we can't actually mark them until after the after the hand in date. But yeah, by all means. Uh, send it, send it in our name. Yeah. But with the draft, is it the same with draft? Yeah, yeah. So oh, sorry, with draft, yeah. No, you can send on a draft any time. But, but the feedback on the draft, would that come earlier? Would that come? Oh, no. Draft? I mean, basically, when you send on a draft, I'll try and get to it within a, a couple of days. Okay, no, yeah, no, sorry. No, that, that yeah, wasn't clear. Sorry. Sorry, no, that wasn't. No, that uh, that's nothing to do with. Uh, right. Sorry, the, the plagiarism checker checker. <laughs> like that. Sorry, sorry. No, no. Uh, uh, say if you send on a draft, try and get to it as soon as possible. Okay. Try to uh, inundate you with all this paper. Um, get to a little bit more to the. Potatoes out of the assignment, uh, and we're going to think about reviewing, uh, reviewing books. Okay, uh, as you'll see, this uh, little handout is just simply uh, adapted um, from a, a review, um, uh, or sorry, by, from uh, Wendy Belcher's piece, Writing uh, the Academic Book Review. Uh, so we're going to just read through this uh, on the principle of why bark when you have a dog. Uh, I haven't kind of uh, created an entirely new uh, handout, handout in this, and uh, Wendy says it much better, I'm sure, I'm sure than Good. So, so uh, first thing uh, is first reading the book. So yes, good idea if you're doing a book review to, to read the book. Uh, believe it or not, doesn't always happen. Uh, so uh, any of you uh, like me studied English literature for their A level uh, may have <laughs> may have done that. Uh, Sparks notes or whatever it was back in those days. Uh, you read those, you didn't, didn't read the book. You know, uh, uh, Jane Austen really was tedious. Uh, so um, <laughs> so uh, so reading 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 the book. Read the book. Uh, when you do so, it's best when writing a book review to be an active reader of the book. So uh, again, uh, you thought uh, yesterday with Sarah about the whole idea of active reading. Uh, sit at a desk with pen and paper uh, in hand. So uh, again, um, you're, you're better to kind of make notes uh, as you go along. Uh, and as you read, stop frequently to summarize the argument. 
So, so again, a, a book review is about following the line of the argument of the, of the book. You know, sometimes maybe when you're you're reading a book, you underline all the all the purple passages, and you go, oh, okay, it says that really, really well. You know, you know, oh, never thought of that before. That's not what you're doing in an academic book review. You're trying to ensure that you follow the, the flow of thought uh, within the within the book. So you so you want to kind of just make sure you're you're stopping uh, and summarizing uh, the argument. Uh, maybe that's uh, in a kind of a subsection or if the chapters are shorter or whatever you know so so find natural breaks uh, in the text where you, you kind of stop and stop and summarize again note any particularly clear statements uh, of the books uh, the book's argument or, or the books uh, the book's purpose and as you go along kind of describe your describe your own responses uh, to what what's being said so you, at this point you might want to say something like you know the clear you know this is a little note that is a very clear argument or you know it's not particularly clear you know or you know so just kind of how your kind of own reactions as you as you go as you go along this is this is this is very this is very you know, confusing you know that, you know she clearly sets out four clear points you know or, or you know so so again just thinking about your own responses and if you've read in this active way then putting together the book review should be quick and straightforward some people refer to, uh, prefer to read at the computer, uh, but if you're a good typist, uh, you often start typing up long quotations from the book instead of analysing it. So, so again, uh, that, that's one of the dangers. Uh, you know, that you cut and paste big chunks of text. Uh, so so try, uh, try to avoid that. And again, uh, as Belcher says, paper and pen provides a little friction uh, to prevent you drifting. So again, it's probably better to to pen and paper uh, along the way. Uh, some people I know, if they, um, and very often at the back of a book, you know, you'll have eight or ten blank pages. Um, but some people make their notes there that I know of. Uh, so that's another way of doing it. Make sure the book's your own. Don't do, the, don't do that in a library book. <laughs> so uh, let me let me reiterate that. You know, Claire will have my life. You know, if you want to do that. But, but, but yeah. But again, just writing in that, writing in the notes, uh, and reminding yourself of that. Okay. Take particular note of, of the title. Does the book deliver what the title suggests it's going to deliver? You know. So so again, is is a, it, you know does the the content of the book match uh, match the title? So, so again, you're you're thinking about that. Sometimes you get very snazzy titles, and you kind of think, you know, what's that all about? You know, uh, uh, and how does that relate to relate to relate to the relate to the book? Uh, you know, so it's uh, you know, so you pick up War and Peace, and then you uh, start to read it, and you realise it's not about marriage. You know, so it's uh, you know, so so does it does it does the title and the uh, and the content uh, do these things match? Uh, table of contents, uh, again, does the book cover all the ground you think it should? Uh, the preface, and again, that very often has a very rich source of, of information about the book. You know, very often in the preface, they, the author will tell you why they've written the book, uh, their, their kind of intentions, what they're, what they're seeking to do, you know, you know, what inspired the book. You know, so again, thinking about those types of things. And again, the index of the book, is there a good index? Uh, is it accurate? Uh, is it broad? Uh, is it deep? So, you know, there's nothing more frustrating to kind of, you know, have a big book and then realise at the end of it, you know, there's only two pages of index, you know, and, you know, you can't find anything. Uh, so, uh, so again, uh, looking at that. So, uh, again, Belcher suggests some questions to keep in mind as you're reading. Uh, what is the book's argument? Uh, so, uh, you know, what, what's this book about? What, what kind of argument are they making? Does the book do what it says it's going to do? So again, you're thinking about the, the title and the, and the purpose movie expressed in the preface. Is the book a contribution to the field or discipline? Uh, so, so again, uh, you know, how, do, how does this sit uh, maybe with some other, uh, in relation to some other uh, books on the, the, same, the same subject uh, or uh, in this particular discipline? Does the book relate to a current debate or a trend in the field? Uh, and if so, if so, how? You know, so if you're reading something, you know, if you're reading John Piper's book, A Response to N.T. Wright, you know, clearly that's a, a 
a discussion in the in that field. So it's making a contribution to an ongoing ongoing debate. And very often you'll find in the course of the book itself uh, that the the author and academic books will set their own work in the context of other debates and arguments that are that are that are going on. So so look out for that. Uh, what's the theoretical lineage of the book, or school of thought out of which the book uh, rises? Uh, so you know, is the person driven by a kind of a, a Marxist agenda, or are they just driven by an agenda where they're committed to reform theology? Are they uh, driven by a, an agenda where they're uh, driven by liberation theology, whatever it might be. So, so kind of what is that theoretical uh, lineage that's, that's going on there? Is the book well written? Uh, again, just thinking uh, thinking about that. Uh, uh, what, what are the book's terms uh, and are they defined? How accurate is the information? Uh, for example, uh, footnotes, bibliography, uh, dates, uh, are, are, they, are, are they accurate? Are the illustrations helpful? If there are no illustrations, should there have been? You know, so sometimes you kind of think a, a diagram of that would have been would have been helpful. You know, so I'm reading this book on the Wesleyan quadrilateral, and I'm trying to work out what is a Wesleyan quadrilateral. You know, so uh, would a diagram have been um, been useful? Who would benefit from reading the book? You know, so you might say I won't give that to the dog, but you kind of have to kind of think a little bit a little bit beyond that. Uh, again, how does the book compare to other books in the field? You may not be able to answer that. That you know, that may not be. Uh, you know, so so it's not critical you answer all of these questions. You know, but again, these are the types of questions that you uh, you, you need to bear in mind. If it's a textbook, what courses can it be used in, and how clear is the book structure uh, and examples? It can be worthwhile to do a, an online search to get a sense of the author's history. Other books, uh, university appointments, graduate advisor, uh, and so on. And again, this can provide you with a with useful, uh, useful context. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you do an online search and discover this person is, is the Regis Professor of Biblical Languages at Oxford University. Yeah, they're probably going to know what they're talking about. Are they writing about biblical, biblical languages? Here's a leading person in their, in their field. You know, uh, you might discover then that somebody, you know, is a uh, the, the professor of uh, you know military history at Ballygo Backwards, uh, you know university, uh, and you discover well actually he might not know as much about biblical languages, you know, but he's decided there's money to be made in this, you know. So uh, so again, just thinking about the the, the, the person who person who's writing this. Second point then is to make a plan. Book reviews are usually somewhere between six hundred and two thousand words uh, in length. And in this assignment, the aim is for a thousand words. Uh, some say a review should be written in a month. And you're two weeks reading the book, one week planning your review, and one week writing it. Just as you should write an outline for an essay, you should always outline the book review before you write it. So again, just thinking about what am I going to include uh, in this book review. So, so again, just thinking, you know, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to have uh, six paragraphs. You know, what's, what's each paragraph going to be? Again, that will keep you uh, on task, and it will stop you from straying into writing a whole academic essay, which you don't need to. Uh, you don't need to do. So, uh, classic book review structure is as follows: uh, title, including complete bibliographical citation for the work; title in full; author, place, publisher; date of publication; edition statement; pages; special features; price; and ISBN. So not necessarily in that order, because that will be a different order from the one I've shown you, the, the example I've given you at the end, uh, but you need to include that type of, type of information. Secondly, a, a section identifying the thesis and whether the author achieves the stated purpose of, of, of the book. You know, so he, he set out to write a book uh, about the, the history of the evangelism of, of China. You know, has, he, has, he, has he accomplished that? Uh, a paragraph summarising the book, uh, a section then on the book's strengths, a section on the book's weaknesses, and a final section on your assessment of the book's strengths and weaknesses. Now, so the book's very strong, uh, you know, in terms of explaining, you know, how the evangelism of China uh, got off uh, off the ground uh, amongst evangelicals in the 1800s. Uh, the book is weak. 
uh, it fails to recognize the contribution of Catholic missionaries to China before that, your assessment might be then, yeah, this is a super book, very, very, very helpful, but we need to recognize that it doesn't X, Y, Z. Sorry, because you'll see this in the American Academy, so you can make value judgments to it yep. to an extent. Yeah, uh, but yeah, so this is one of those rare examples, I suppose, where it is to some extent about your, yeah. about, it's your opinion of the book. But you can't just say it's good. So you yes, have, you have yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, you know, again, if, if I send you a book review and you, David looks as good, well, I don't care what David Luke thinks, yeah. you know, so, <laughs> you know, whether well, it's good, good, bad, or indifferent, you know. So, so uh, again, you want something that will make the reader think, you know, kind of, yeah. oh, this is why he thinks it's good, you know, it really. He thinks it's good because it really explains, you know, or it really helps us to understand, or, you know, gives us a clear view of, you know, or he thinks uh, it's not a great book because, yeah, as he says, you know, it doesn't really, you know, it's not really helpful for the, the general reader, you know, it's too, it's too technical, it's too technical, you know, so I, I had to review a book, um, and, you know, it's very, very, very good book, but I looked at it and thought, well, who's actually going to read this? You know, so it's too too technical for the general reader and too popular for an academic audience. So, you know, I wrote this in a review, you know, a great book, but I'm not really sure who it's, who it's pitched at, you know, so you can kind of make those kinds of, kinds of judgments, you know, and, and, that, and that's perfectly acceptable. Okay, writing the review. Uh, once you've read the book, try to spend no more than one or two weeks writing the review. Allowing a great deal of time to fall between reading the book and writing about it is unfair to you and the author. The point of writing something short like a book review is to do it quickly. Sending a publication to a journal or an external examiner is always scary. But sitting on the review won't make it less so. You know, so, so get, it, get, it, get it done. Uh, Avoiding five common pitfalls. So again, I pick up on what Johnny said there. Evaluate the text, don't just summarize it. And while a succinct restatement of the text points is important, part of writing a book review is making a judgment. Is the book a contribution to the field? Does it add to our knowledge? Should this book be read and by whom? One needn't be negative to evaluate. For instance, explaining how a text relates contributes to current debates in the field is a form of evaluation. So again, it doesn't mean you have to kind of slam it to, to critically evaluate it. That's not what criti critical evaluation is about. Uh, so, so you are being asked to evaluate it. Do not cover everything secondly in the book. In other words, don't use the table of contents as the structuring principle for review. Try to organize your review <coughs> around the book's argument and or your argument about the book. Okay, so we don't want to see in chapter one he deals with chapter two then he says in chapter three you know apart from that you're going to use up all your words you know so so you want to kind of uh, really uh, uh, you know think about uh, the book's argument uh, and deal with that. Thirdly judge the book by its intentions not yours. Don't criticize the author for failing to write the book you think he or she should have written. As John Updike puts it do not imagine yourself the caretaker of any tradition an enforcer of any party standards, a warrior in any ideological battle, a corrections officer of any kind. Uh, so again, you're reviewing the book, telling us about it in its own terms, and not what you think should have been, uh, should have been, should have been in there. Likewise, don't spend too much time focusing on the gaps. Since a book is only 200 to 500 pages, it cannot possibly address the richness of, of any topic. For this reason, the most common criticism in any review is that the book doesn't address some part of the topic. If the book reports to be about ethnicity and yet lacks a chapter on Latinos, by all means, mention it, but don't belabor the point. Another trick of reviewers is to focus too much on books the author did not cite. If you're using their bibliography just to display your own knowledge, it will be obvious to the reader. Keep such criticisms brief. So... Uh, Again, uh, you know, you don't want to come across in the book review as a, as a know-it-all. You know, really, they should have consulted me. You know, <laughs> I would have helped them help, help them write this. You know, so so again, don't focus too much on, on things you think they may have missed. So again, you, you might want to, you might you might want to, you might want to mention that. Uh, I was writing something recently, and I came across the fact the the, the author had um, 
in the course of his book misquoted uh, uh, the page references to, uh, to a particular uh, book he was referring to. I said this to my to my, my daughter, and uh, she said, Dad, don't go there. Don't be that guy. <laughs> you know, so felt chastened after thinking it was right. Clever clogs for uh, you know for, for for thirty seconds. You know, so so uh, uh, so so I say don't 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 be that guy. Fifthly, don't use too many quotations for the book. It's best to paraphrase or use short telling quotations within sentences. So again, if quotations keep them to kind of like half a sentence or something like that, don't be kind of you know quoting you know you're only a thousand words. Don't be using up. 750 words and quotations, you know, so, so summarize, paraphrase, uh, and use short, pithy telling uh, quotations rather than, uh, say, filling your, your review with quotations. At the top of your review, then, uh, you should have the bibliographic citation, okay? Uh, so this is how your, your book review will start. So there, there's an example from, oh, I've realized I've kind of got it, got it wrong in my, my version. Um, Hopefully, can I just see yours really silent? Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, just the bottom. Sorry, stroke out the, the SG bit there, and that uh, was a carryover from. Uh, uh, from so the bibliographic citation is a bit different from how you would how you would enter it in a in a bibliography. So in the bibliography you would enter it in Harvard style, uh, you know. So it would be Dempster SG two thousand and three and so on. But for for this exercise, it's as if you're going into the bookshop to ask for it. Uh, so you're going into Waterstones or the Evangelical Bookshop. Uh, all the bookshops are available. Uh, you go in and say, I'm looking for Stephen Dempster's book, Dominion and Dynasty. It was published in 2003. You know, so, so it's that kind of idea that you have with this. So, so it's not exactly the same as you would put it into a bibliography. It, it's more, say, uh, in this more, more popular style. Um, yep, you include the ISBN, uh, 10, whatever that might be. Uh, Number of pages that are in it, as I said above, there any uh, uh, diagrams, maps, etc. You can mention that. Um, 257 pages, number of pages, and the price, so the retail price. So don't be saying, yeah, but you can get it cheaper in ICM books. You know, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it's the it's the price. Uh, you know, the kind of the, the standard retail price is 14. Okay, any questions uh, Questions about that? So, when you give the list of books to pick from, uh, it states title, author, and year. Yeah. Stick to the year. Yeah. If there's a revised edition between then and now, you don't want to not sure. Hey, look, I'm, uh, in this exercise, I'm not precious uh, about this. So, if you have a, Look at and it, you know it's a, it's the it's the 2017 edition, but you have the the 2011 version at home. <coughs> Do that. Don't be going out and buying a, another edition of the edition of the book. You know, so don't don't worry about anything. I don't think like that. So I'm not particularly precious about that. So uh, you know, uh, don't don't worry too much about that. Or you know, you or you see the the one on the thing is 2017, but you can buy it for 50p on Amazon to have a personal copy. That you can work from. Do that. Say, so, I'll be saying, hang on here, man. You know, that's only that's only the second edition, and there's now a seventh edition. You know, so, so don't don't worry too much too much about that. It's about the exercise. You know, not doing doing that well. Yeah. Yeah, I think they are. Yeah, uh, my memory serves me serves me correctly, Stephen. I think they I think they are, but you'll have the chance to kind of see them on the shelves. Okay, um, we're a wee bit tight for time here, uh, but uh, the net will be patient with me. Okay, um, 
The second little exercise that you're being asked to uh, accomplish here is the, the, the summarizing of an article. So academic articles are an important resource in postgraduate study. Summarizing an academic article is itself a key academic skill. Uh, classic articles on a subject and the most up-to-date research are often found in academic journal articles. And summarizing uh, these then becomes, becomes crucial. When conducting your research, it's important that you can condense articles into the key message. Uh, and this is an important tool both for personal reference and for your inclusion in an assignment. So, uh, what's this all about? First of all, your aim. What's the purpose of your summary? So, if the purpose of your summary is to take notes for later, sorry, to later remind yourself about an article, you may choose a longer summary. So, if you're doing this for yourself and you're, you're doing a, a, an assignment, you're writing an article, but that might be a bit of a longer, a longer summary. If the purpose of the summary is to include it in your assignment, then the summary should focus specifically on how it relates to this. So again, uh, you know, you have a, a, a long uh, article, you know, but maybe only a couple of paragraphs actually relate to what you're doing. You know, so if you're, uh, you know, so if you are writing a, a, an essay uh, on the, the sacramental theology of John Calvin go to an article on sacramental theology uh, and your specific focus is, is the Lord's Supper. And there's only three paragraphs and that, that's the bit you want to want to focus on. You don't need a, a summary of the entire things. You might write just a, simply a brief summary where he says X, Y, and, X, y, and Z. And so, uh, uh, in general. So again, uh, read the article. Um, allow time to read it. Uh, before you write about it, you need to understand it. Remember, it's only when you can explain the article clearly in your own words that you're ready to write about it. So uh, first tip then is to scan the article uh, to avoid getting bogged down in the detail. So identify the, the main sections of the article. Uh, this will include the research question and the reason for the study. And this is usually stated in the introduction. So uh, the research question is, uh, the author's looking at, was Luke the author of Hebrews? So what's he going to do? He, he says he's going to offer new evidence on an old question. So you've gleaned that from the introduction. Was Luke the author of Hebrews? Here's new evidence on an old question. So uh, what's, the, what's the study about? Okay. So you then want to uh, look for the, the thesis or the main point of the article. Again, very often this is found in the introduction. And you again... You know, in our uh, imaginary article, is to demonstrate that Luke is the author of Hebrews. So this is what this article uh, is about. He wants to show uh, that Luke is the author of, of Hebrews. You want to then look for the approach uh, that has been adopted. In other words, what has been his method? Uh, how has he set about doing this? Well, he's comparing the language of Hebrews to Luke Acts. So uh, again, uh, this is his method. How were the findings interpreted? Uh, this is the discussion. So how does the writer make his case? Uh, so you want to, you want to identify, identify that. The conclusions drawn. Now this conclusion might be there's considerable evidence that Luke is the author of Hebrews. So, so again, you're, you're looking for his conclusions. Now if the articles, very often academic articles, particularly when you see them online, have an abstract and it might help you with this task, but don't rely on the abstract to cover everything. Okay, so don't think <laughs> I'll rejig the words in the abstract. You know, I'll be three hundred words. You know, uh, so so again, read the article um, for yourself. So, uh, kind of a brief, kind of quick scan read to find out what's going on in the article. Then begin detailed reading. Again, read uh, actively. Highlight key sentences. Make notes in the margin. Uh, whatever you, you want to do. And keep in mind the key questions. Uh, what are the main ideas? What evidence is being offered to support the conclusions? What does this study contribute toward answering the original question? Uh, and what are, does the article contribute to studies in this field? So you might find, again, you might, you might find this in a field you don't know an awful lot about. Uh, but again, you might find that the, the article itself says, you know, you know, Joe Bloggs has said this, and people have believed this. So that's his contribution. He's saying, I disagree with Bloggs. 
or I support blogs, you know, so you can kind of discern the, something, even if you don't uh, know an awful lot, maybe about what's going on in the, uh, in the wider in the wider field. As always, then, avoid plagiarism. Uh, this is clearly a, a, a risk when you're summarizing someone else's work. And to help uh, you avoid this, first of all, take notes in your own words. Using short notes or summarizing key points in your own words forces you to rewrite the ideas in your own words later. So, you know, you, so you're, you're writing the review from your notes rather than go back into the article uh, and you're summarizing as you go, as you go along. If you find yourself sticking closely to the original wording, uh, the advice is that then you probably don't understand the article. So you're simply par parroting back then the author's own language. So if in doubt, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, myxomatosis and wild crows, you know, you, you kind of uh, parrot that back. I'm not clear what that means, but, <laughs> but he says it, you know. So, so again, uh, important to, to write in your own words. So... Writing the summary, the purpose of an article summary is to give you a brief overview of the study. To write a good summary, you need to identify the key information and condense it. And this really is what the exercise you're being given uh, to do is about. Uh, in these three articles you're being asked to summarize, you're to find the key information. You're, you need to identify that, uh, and that forms the core of your, the core of your summary. So there's going to be a lot of other stuff going on there, but what, what is the essence of what's going on? Uh, begin a draft then, or a first draft, uh, using the same structure as the article itself. Be careful to bear in mind the length of the summary. So there's no point in having a 3,000 word summary of a 5,000 word article. Uh, that's not a summary. Uh, and for a, 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 a thousand word summary, uh, remember you have to provide uh, 300 words of a summary. So uh, again, just be careful uh, in your first draft. You're aiming for 300 words. Don't be writing a thousand words. Sorry, you're aiming for 300 words each. So don't, don't be kind of writing a thousand words in the first one. And then, oh, gosh. You know, yeah. you know so, so try uh, as far as possible, uh, even if you only write it in point form initially, you know, to, to kind of keep it, keep it short, uh, keep it brief. Uh, and again, this should be drafted as, as free, free writing. State uh, then the research question and explain why it's interesting, that terrible word, uh, or why it is of interest uh, really to people in that field. Uh, and this might include, for example, the question of how it relates to previous studies. You know, so this is a, is a new contribution you know, to, to a long-standing debate. Uh, state the thesis, so what's he arguing again? Uh, what's, the, what's the point of the article? Briefly describe the methods involved in the study. Uh, the design of it, you know, so he sets out to compare uh, the text of Luke Acts to Hebrews. Uh, he did this by going back to such and such a manuscript. Uh, he does this in consultation with the, uh, the wider body of uh, literature on Hebrews, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, however, however he designs this. Outline the conclusions reached by the author. Why might they be regarded uh, as significant? Finally, explain the key implications of the results. Again, avoid overstating their importance. <coughs> this is the most important piece of work ever written on the history of uh, John Calvin. Yeah, so it's highly unlikely, but 